everybody. My name is Jane Anderson. I'm an associate professor at New York University and the Hatta Lenape Ho King. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement of where I'm situated and to pay my respects to the ancestors and to the elected and present and emerging leaders of these lands and waters. Hello, I'm Brad Sherman, Professor of Law at the University of Queensland. I too would like to do a land acknowledgement, paying respect to the Jaguar people, past, present and future. Today's presentation, Jane and I will be talking about the Nagoya Protocol and what it means for plant scientists globally. The Nagoya Protocol was passed in 2014. There are 130 countries that are members of the Nagoya. Its goal is to provide member states with guidance about how the Convention on Biological Diversity is to be implemented. The CBD was a treaty from the 1990s that provided nation states with sovereignty over their plant genetic resources and allowed them to introduce um, access and benefit sharing schemes. While parties could agree on many points when negotiating the Nagoya Protocol, many issues were left uncertain that we'll talk about uh, in due course. So the two key questions that we feel are probably the most important for us to cover in, us, in our short presentation today is really who needs to comply with Nagoya and what does it mean to be Nagoya compliant? So one of the most important things about Nagoya and why we're talking about it today is really thinking about the global, its global reach. Uh, Nagoya regulates behaviour outside of the countries where it has been adopted international law, inter, international law, and that is really important. And the reason for this is that countries that have ratified the protocol are not only an, under an obligation to ensure that the biological material used in the country is Nagoya compliant, they're also under an obligation to ensure that the biological material imported into the country was collected, used and or developed in compliance with the protocol. This would mean, for example, that a researcher in Australia, which is not yet implemented in Nagoya, who wanted to export material to France, which does have a Nagoya compliant domestic law, would need to show that the material was Nagoya compliant in Australia. Another key feature of the Nagoya, which is important, is that it extends to include non-state actors. And this includes organisations such as universities, herbaria and scientific journals, uh, funding agencies, which have made Nagoya compliance a precondition of dealing with biological materials. So if we have to think about who needs to comply with Nagoya, and you know, thinking through what Brad had said earlier around uh, why Nagoya was established and, and how Nagoya is about thinking through and supporting um, interests that include Indigenous people and local communities. The question of who needs to comply with Nagoya is really important. So firstly, researchers in countries that have adopted Nagoya must comply with local domestic laws. This would mean, for example, that a, a research in Germany, which has a German domestic law of Nagoya, would need to comply with those domestic laws. Secondly, researchers who want to export genetic resources to a country that has adopted Nagoya must comply with the law in that country. This would mean, for example, the example I mentioned before, a researcher in Australia who wanted to export material to France would need to comply with French law in Australia. And then thirdly, researchers who want to work with non-state actors that have decided that they want to be Nagoya compliant. This would mean, for example, that a researcher again in Australia that has not adopted Nagoya, who wanted to export to the University of California, which has unilaterally decided that it will only deal with material that is Nagoya compliant, has to show that that research was done in a Nagoya compliant fashion. One of the key questions, as Jay mentioned, is what does it mean to be Nagoya compliant? In most cases, it is relatively straightforward and uh, you need to show two things. The first one, you have to show prior informed consent when the material is collected. And this is simply that the party providing access to the materials knows what they are doing and um, they have some sort of sense of where the material will be used and what it will be used for. The second is around access and benefit sharing and uh, access and benefit sharing is uh, 
you know, something that researchers need to spend a little bit of time thinking about. I think when we hear the word benefit sharing, uh, it's it's uh, thought to be just about monetary compensation. Access and benefit sharing is really broad and much more um, diverse than just uh, monetary compensation. It includes non-monetary compensation, uh, such as sharing research results, uh, knowledge sharing at the point of starting a research relationship, developing partnerships for future relationships. Uh, so there's a broad spectrum and it doesn't just happen at the end of uh, kind of collecting or research. It can be through the, the whole durational component of uh, conducting research with, with partners and partnerships. I think if you take away one point from today's presentation, it should be that point that the benefits can be non-monetary. And for most plant scientists, it will be non-monetary. So in some countries, uh, there are agreements that are put in place in relationship to access and benefit sharing. Uh, so for example, a country that has adopted Nagoya, you might need to lodge uh, the access and benefit sharing agreement with an ABS clearinghouse. However, in other countries, there is no competent authority for lodging uh, ABS agreement. And that does also create different kinds of challenges. So you're gonna need to understand and check which country you're working in and what the conditions are around ABS and agreements and whether they need to be lodged within an ABS clearinghouse. As I mentioned earlier, there are a number of potential problems with Nagoya uh, and Jane and I have identified and like to highlight four. The first one relates to historical collections. The key problem here is that some countries such as South Africa and Norway have th their laws stipulate that um, Nagoya applies to materials irrespective of when they were collected. So something collected 100 years ago, if someone wants to deal with it now, they need to be Nagoya compliant. In contrast, in Europe, the laws stipulate that the Nagoya compliance only needs to occur after the treaty has been implemented, which is probably around 2014 in Europe. This creates real problems, particularly in dealing with non-state actors, where the question arises, which Nagoya do we have to comply with? Other problems arise about the exclusion from the Goya that was negotiated to, to protect uh, essential plants for food security. Different countries have adopted different approaches, ranging from those that uh, exclude Annex 1 materials from the plant treaty, others will say Annex 1 material plus material in the multilateral system. And there are a third group of countries which stipulate that materials excluded when it adopts a particular language of international law. It's confusing and uncertain and creates problems. The third area where there are difficulties in relation to digital sequence information or genomic information about plants. It's unclear whether access providers need to negotiate benefit sharing agreements with people who are taking genomic data from plants, um, genetic materials. It's also unclear that how, if it is included within the scope of Nagoya or the CBD, how benefits will be shared back to people, particularly because DSI or digital sequence information is not used in the same bilateral fashion as plant genetic resources. A fourth problem, which Jane will talk about, deals with traditional knowledge. So one of the challenges around traditional knowledge and associated traditional knowledge, particularly in research um, around genetic resources, is to what extent it's properly attributed or proper provenance is connected back to those communities who have contributed traditional knowledge in the first place. This is also connected into some of the DSI questions as well. Uh, so for uh, the key issues that Indigenous peoples and local communities are experiencing in relationship to thinking through the challenges around traditional knowledge and um, digital sequence information is really firstly how to recognise Indigenous rights and interests in raw data and in DSI within open data environments. How do you keep that information, how do you keep provenance with the sequence as it travels across multiple systems? Um, how to share DSI, how to collaborate around ethical access and use in ways that are consistent with existing community protocols. And thirdly, how to negotiate equitable outcomes from the use of DSI, including potential commercialization. So these are part of a much bigger conversation that needs to take place. We're here just to kind of map some of those pieces for you today um, and look forward to some of the conversations that are going to emerge after our colleagues have spoken. Thank you so much for, for, for listening. Thank you.